Hey everybody, um, here we are again. Got another lecture for you this week, this time about the home front during World War II. So um, let's get started. First of all, uh, last time we left off by talking about uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. So America was taking slow steps to involvement in World War II and that uh, changed abruptly on December 7th of 1941 with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and we immediately declared war on Japan. Shortly after, Germany will declare war on us and we'll declare war back on them. So um, the first question that I started with in the live lecture was, what do you think the response would be to an attack like the attack on Pearl Harbor? What would you, if you were the leader of the country, propose that we do? And all of that kind of building to this question of whether we should use our resources to go after Japan, to go after Germany, or to go after both, right? And so we are in a situation now where we're at war with both of them. We've been directly attacked by Japan, uh, and Germany is pos posing a major threat to our allies. So I asked people in the uh, live lecture, what do you think we should do? Go, go hit Japan, hit Germany, or go after both? And there was some discussion. Most of it was split between either going after Japan or going after both. The um, British and French are going to um, encourage us to go after both, and that's ultimately what we're going to do. We're going to realize that if we don't go after Germany, we're going to lose our allies in Europe. And that's going to be a, a big problem. So um, we'll get back to that question in just a second. But it, it, it also, uh, Pearl Harbor also resulted in a direct response to Japan. Japan, on the day after Pearl Harbor, moved into the Philippines. And by April, so just after three, four months, they had totally conquered and occupied the island. So Japan's going to occupy the Philippines until the end of the war. So we lose a territorial possession for Filipino people, right? So 1898, um, the Spanish are kicked out and uh, the Americans occupy. Now the uh, Americans are kicked out and the Japanese are occupying. And a brutal uh, reign of terror by the Japanese as well. So um, this link here, I'll post this uh, PowerPoint on my school as well. This link, the Bataan Death March, just this terrible relocation of Americans and Filipinos from one side of the island to the other that became notorious for the brutality from the Japanese. So beheadings, um, shooting people if they fell down, uh, shooting people for sport, just terrible, terrible stories. Uh, and this link, there was a, a gentleman from Salinas who served in World War II, and this link will take you to an interview about his experience on the Bataan Death March. He was part of that march to Bataan. So the Japanese are moving into the Pacific. They're, they're trying to conquer and take possession of islands as they can kind of move west and set up um, bases for attacking us, right? Remember, they had attacked China previously. So this Germany first strategy, the British government uh, lobbies the United States to help them defeat the British first, and in the meantime, keep the Japanese at bay. Um, but Hitler was a bigger threat or a bigger perceived threat at the time to kind of global security than was uh, Japan. So look at this map, and you can see by 1942 that Hitler had made some pretty impressive gains throughout Europe. So the United States and Britain will agree on a Europe-first strategy or a Germany-first strategy that um, is attempting to stop the spread of Nazism throughout Europe. So they're going to focus on Hitler. We're going to help. Um, we're going to send resources. Um, eventually, we're going to open up a second front uh, in Western Europe. Uh, the Soviet Union's joining the battle. So the goal is tackle Hitler, keep Japan at bay. So one of the questions that America had to uh, face was, what is this going to do? This is a division of our resources. Are we going to be better off fighting on two fronts, or should we just focus our attention on one? And if so, which one should that be? Um, we end up dividing our resources, but we have some, some major successes, some major naval successes in the Pacific. The Battle of Midway, a famous uh, U.S. battle victory in World War II, uh, and we implement a strategy of island hopping, where rather than going right after Japan, we're going to start to go after these little islands in the South Pacific and um, work our way towards Japan, one little island at a time, trying to liberate uh, each of those islands. Okay, um, so that takes us to the home front. And your discussion board post this week was about uh, Japanese internment, so I'm looking forward to reading your responses. But the... Um, the Japanese at home in the United States were uh, rounded up and interned if they were living in 
the military zone. And this happened by order of the president. So the president is going to issue executive order 9066, which will uh, turn the whole west coast of the United States. You can see the date on this. This is a month and a half after Pearl Harbor. This executive order turns the whole west coast of the United States into a military zone and allows the military to decide who is allowed to be there and who is not. And they make the decision that most Americans are just fine being in this military zone, but Japanese Americans are not. And so they are rounded up, whether they're American citizens or not American citizens, and they're relocated and they're put in these internment camps. And so, uh, you know, the question is why? Uh, was there a real threat from the Japanese Americans on the West Coast? Uh, most of the evidence doesn't suggest that there was a real significant threat. Uh, and so it was largely a response that was driven by fear at the time. And xenophobia, fear of other cultures, that sort of stuff. So hopefully you looked at those documents and you came to some conclusions about the motives the, behind the Japanese internment. All right. A uh, major development in the United States economically. So by 1940, the United States mobilizes for war. This is prior to... Uh, the attack. Remember, we had been we had been producing for the war before that as we started to change our neutrality policies. Um, and you'll see over the course of the next four years, by 1944, we go from this unemployment rate, this massive unemployment rate of like 20 percent down to three percent, which is like a healthy economy. It's about as low as you can go with an unemployment rate. So um, massive gains. And this is largely the result of government producing for war. So the investments that the government is making now in the economy are uh, substantially larger than the New Deal investments. And this was a criticism of the New Deal from the left was that the, le that the New Deal didn't do enough. It didn't go far enough, not enough of a government investment. And we see that when the government really does invest in the economy, you do have this reduction of unemployment. And that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. The government just invested $2 trillion in keeping our uh, economy going. And we'll see what impact it has as we're kind of facing um, off with a recession and possible depression as a result of the shelter in place orders from the coronavirus. So, yeah, that's all well and good. But look at what happens to our debt from 27 billion in 1930 to 268 billion in 1946. So we become this uh, massively indebted society. And as you know, that's only gotten worse since then. Uh, and so today for government to cobbled together this two trillion dollar bailout package <laughs> it's massively extending our, our debt liability okay and so um, that also will have consequences for the economy down the road <coughs> also on the home front we're seeing migrations so people are moving this is another great migration where people are moving uh, west and north out of the south so you don't see very much um, very many people moving to the to the south. You don't see very many people actually moving even to the North Atlantic, right? So they're losing population. We're starting to see the development of a region called the Sun Belt. And this is where new technologies, um, the companies are going to set up shop for new technologies. California is going to have a boom during this time period. And this time, time the, uh, the weather is good and the land is cheap. And so uh, people are moving and they're going to continue to move to these areas throughout the last half of the 20th century. Okay, uh, Women are going to uh, serve in the military at this time as um, auxiliary corps in the Navy, in the Army, um, in the Coast Guard. And this is uh, largely because of need, right? So 15 million men are going to serve in the military and we still uh, will need um, more. And so women are going to take some of those office jobs, non-combat uh, non roles, um, and not even combat support roles, usually desk jobs, office jobs, that sort of stuff. Um, we have a draft in World War II, and that draft is going to have an impact on our labor markets. Uh, and so we're going to have to find more labor sources. And as we know, historically, we've talked about this, we talked about this in History 17, um, that when you have a large number of immigrants, that is, uh, creates a, a huge labor pool. And so we're going to see that the United States in just a second will adopt some policies uh, to encourage immigration to the United States. All right. Um, a couple of links here as well. You can go to the PowerPoint and check out these links. Um, Donald Duck in Nazi land. Uh, so if you want to see Donald Duck as a Nazi, uh, it was originally called Donald Duck in Nazi land. They changed the title of the cartoon to uh, De Fuhrer's Face after the uh, name of the, the song in the cartoon. It won an Academy Award for short cartoons. 
Um, check it out. Disney got in on the act. Um, Dr. Seuss was using uh, his cartoons. Uh, Warner Brothers made cartoons. So this is a, a, a mobilization effort on the home front, unlike uh, any we've seen. So check out those links. Um, really, the government is working to mobilize uh, public opinion because we've moved very quickly from being isolationist to being all in. Um, at home, so women are going to take those jobs that, that the uh, men are leaving behind as they're going to join the, the war. But you also um, have uh, a program called the Bracero Program, which is going to encourage uh, the immigration of Mexican farm workers. So we're, we're calling uh, Mexican workers up from the South. This is going to be such a successful program and keep the, the price of food so low that it's going to last 20 years longer than the war does. And it's created a legacy today of migrant farm workers that still are working in our farms to this day, even though the Bracero program is no longer in place. Okay. Race during wartime is a major issue. We have a segregated military. It's segregated uh, between black Americans and everybody else. Um, so that is uh, more fuel for the burgeoning civil rights movement. So uh, here I have a link to a document. You can check it out if you'd like. But uh, the black soldiers uh, create what they call the double V campaign. And that means victory at home and victory abroad. So if we're fighting tyranny abroad, we want to fight Hitler. Yes, we want to join this fight with America to fight tyranny abroad. But we also want to fight tyranny at home because we are coming home as black soldiers and facing the tyranny of our local uh, governments, our, our local communities. Um, very famous stories of heroism from this time period by black soldiers, uh, not allowed always in uh, combat positions. Uh, Dory Miller, a famous story, if you've seen the movie Pearl Harbor, not a great movie, but portrays Dory Miller, um, this uh, kitchen worker, black kitchen worker on a, on a boat in Pearl Harbor that um, ends up manning guns, shooting down planes, quite heroic. Okay. Here we see the roots of the civil rights movement again in World War II. So we saw it in World War II, one, again, World War II, some organizations and um, commissions coming out of this. One is the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, by A. Philip Randolph. This was a union that unionized black sleeping car porters. So these are like butlers for fancy uh, trains. And because these workers are black, this becomes a natural place to start organizing for civil rights as well. The FEPC. Uh, is a commission established by FDR to make sure that during wartime, as the government is uh, creating contracts with uh, industry to produce for the war, that the uh, industries that have those contracts with the government cannot discriminate in their hiring practices. So the, uh, the goal is to make sure that um, to encourage companies not to discriminate in their hiring practices and to say, hey, you can't get these government contracts if you do discriminate in your hiring practices. So some major steps forward. Um, Native Americans get involved in the war effort. You've probably heard of the Navajo code talkers who use the Navajo language as a code, an unbreakable code. The Europeans did, had no idea what to do with it uh, and were able to transmit secret transmissions. Um, there's major migrations among Navajo, not just Navajo, but uh, among Native Americans as well, moving from reservations to cities. Um, we see tensions in places in the Southwest with, with new Mexican immigrants and descendants of, of prior Mexican immigrants. Um, and most famously, clashes in California, Los Angeles, San Diego, uh, that became known as the Zoot Suit Riots, where you had um, the Zoot Suiters. So uh, black culture and Mexican culture at the time uh, was wearing in the 1930s and 40s these zoot suits, these big suits, and it was a, a form of rebellion against the wealthier classes, right, to kind of mock and, and dress up like the wealthier classes. But it became a point of contention during World War II as a lot of um, white Americans who are already um, feeling some racial and ethnic tension with their uh, neighbors saw it as unpatriotic, that at a time when we were supposed to be rationing cloth and rationing all these materials that this was an excessive waste. So we saw clashes, violent clashes. You can see a picture there of uh, a couple of young Mexicans who were, who were jumped and beat up uh, for wearing these zoot suits. All right, the war's end. So some major conferences you should be paying attention to during the war and nearing the end of the war. These are the big three, Joseph Stalin on, on the left, FDR in the center, Winston Churchill on the right, representing the USSR, the United States of America, and Great Britain respectively. 
So these are the big three. They will meet uh, multiple times over the course of the war. Uh, one time to coordinate and plan Operation Overlord or D-Day. Another time to discuss the end of the war at the Yalta Conference and also at the, at the Yalta Conference, um, kind of establish a plan for post-war Germany. What's gonna, what is it going to look like as we're nearing the end of the war and the Germans are nearing defeat? What are we going to do with this, this country, right, and this massive Nazi regime? <clears throat> Additionally, the United States knows that they're going to have to continue fighting Japan and they did not want to be alone in that fight. And so they negotiate uh, with the Soviet Union that the Soviet Union will come help fight Japan and, and liberate China after um, the Germans surrender. So then finally, the Potsdam Conference is uh, FDR's, I believe FDR is gone at that point. This is uh, Harry Truman. FDR will die before the war totally ends. Um, but there will be an ultimatum put out for Japan. And this is around the time that we, we are developing our nuclear weapons technology. So we're the first to get these nuclear weapons. We're the only country in the history of the world to use these weapons on a human population. Uh, and the Potsdam was our kind of ultimatum to Japan saying, hey, surrender or else. Uh, Japan's gonna refuse to surrender. We're asking for an unconditional surrender. They, um, there's some indicators that they would have been willing to surrender with some conditions, some things about keeping their emperor in place. Um, but the United States says, no, it's got to be unconditional. Uh, and so there's talk of, do we do a full-scale invasion of Japan to end the war? Or do we try out these new weapons that we have? And ultimately, the decision is made to drop atomic bombs, two atomic bombs, on two separate cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. Massive devastation, just terrible, terrible stories. Talk about um, mass destruction, right? These weapons of mass destruction that are, are dropped on these populations and kill hundreds of thousands of Japanese. So um, if we were in class, we would probably dig into this topic, but I want you to think about this. Uh, was the United States justified in dropping two atomic bombs on Japan? Were they necessary to end the war? Is it just kind of a, a terrible thing that we had to do? Or were there other ways that we could have ended the war? Um, and then how should we remember this, right? How should we remember the uh, droppings of the bombs. Is this, um, is this, you know, was it a necessary thing? Is it, is it something that we should not have done? Um, those are, those are questions that are, are interesting and important to discuss as we are thinking about future decisions and, and how we're handling war and responses to um, crisis situations in the United States. All right, guys, you got a quiz that needs to be done before uh, 1159 on Friday night. So hopefully this will help. I'll also post uh, a link to a Kahoot if you want to do a Kahoot. All right, take care. I'll see you next week.